Sure. Now, it is uh, over to the chairpersons uh, for the first talk. Uh, they will introduce the faculty. First talk is by Madam uh, Jayashi Sood. Over to you, Shamshad Madam and Nandini Madam, please. A very good evening. Um, Giri, am I audible? Yes, madam, you're audible, you're audible. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, first and foremost, before we start this uh, lovely session today, uh, on behalf of all of us, all the speakers and the chairpersons, I must say this is a very beautiful gesture on behalf of ISA Kerala. It is something very sweet that you all have done. You all have thought of having an all-woman team here today, and uh, we are... Uh, mm -hmm. we are uh, I think very thankful and uh, happy to be part of this today evening. And uh, to each one of you and the whole team, a big thank you. And uh, without uh, going into other details, I would love to introduce uh, Dr. Jayashri Sood, ma'am, and she absolutely needs no introduction. But uh, this is a cursory duty that I have to perform. So ma'am has been the chairperson uh, in the Institute of uh, Anesthesia, Pain and Perioperative Medicine in Sri Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. And she's also the joint secretary and in the board of management of Gangaram Hospital. And also she's a member of specialist board in anesthesia of, uh, and this is in the National Board of Examination. She's a founder member, trustee, and CEO of Indian College of Anesthesiologists. And she's been honored with IMA Medical Healthcare Excellence Award in 2019. That is in excellence in anesthesia management at Hyderabad. And she's also got the best teacher award in 2018 and the best academician award in 2011 from Gangaram Hospital. She is a member of editorial boards of national and international journals, and she's been the past president of uh, the Delhi chapter of ISA and ISSP Delhi. She has been credited with about nine orations, prestigious orations from all over, and I won't want to detail them over here, but each one of them have uh, been very credible ones. She has uh, 120 publications to her credit and 24 book chapters. That's a huge thing. And she's the editor of Anesthesia and Laparoscopic Surgery, Anesthesia for Transplant Surgery, and Clinical Thoracic Anesthesia. And she's also the author of Atlas, uh, which is uh, titled as Procedures in Neonate and Pediatric Practice. And she's written the foreword for Oxford Textbook of Pediatric Pain. Ma'am, uh, I can go on all night about you, but I'm sure the crowd is waiting to hear you. So over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nalini, for that <laughs> for that introduction. Thanks a lot, and thank you very much, Dr. Venkatgiri, for having invited us on this very special day. And uh, so I'll be uh, speaking on anesthesia for laparoscopic surgery. Uh, I need to share my slides, Benin. Yes, ma'am. Please share. Yes. Okay. It's visible, madam. Please share again, madam. Yeah, just doing, just doing it. Sorry for this, just a minute. Good evening, everybody. So um, the lecture is on anesthesia for laparoscopic surgery. Uh, for the students, they should know what the history was. When anesthesia for laparoscopic, or rather when laparoscopic surgery was started in the early 80s, the first lap coli was done by Mohe in Germany, and uh, it was not really well recognized and appreciated. 
and the cases or laparoscopic procedures were done only on short and simple cases. That is basically the ASA1 and the young patients. But then as you know, because of the advantages of laparoscopic surgery, which you are very well aware of the shorter hospital stay and rapid return to work, and that the surgeons became more and more confident. Now, high-risk patients, older patients, look at this kind of patients that have been coming now for laparoscopic surgery, and literally there is no patient who is refused. And see the armamentarium which was there earlier on. We had these few uh, uh, laparoscopes and the video monitors. But now see what is the armamentarium in the laparoscopic OT. The robo is though there and the surgery is very often done with the help of a robo known as robotic assisted laparoscopic surgery. So you as students will be seeing a whole array writing starting from the simple cases to these kinds. So in my lecture, it's very important that you must know about the physiological changes. You can never forget that, whatever you may do. Then, of course, the anesthetic management. You must also know the complications and their management. And no talk is complete without a mention on laparoscopy in the COVID era. So let's see what are the physiological changes. Now, it's very simple. If you remember these three things, the trespasses to normal homeostasis in any laparoscopic procedure, that is patient positioning, the insufflating gas, which is carbon dioxide, and the carboperitoneum that is achieved reaching to what is known as the increased intra-abdominal pressure. So if you know what are the changes in these three things, you will understand the physiological changes and all cases will be done scientifically. So let's see the first one the Trenlandberg position, which is very often taken for all guiding procedures, will be helpful for the cardiovascular system and the cardiac output increases. But it is deleterious for the respiratory systems, the FRC, the vital capacity all fall. A term known as endobronchial intubation may result in this position. And this is basically because of the head low position and the, lip, and the ra rising of the diaphragm while the endotracheal tube is fixed proximally, so there is an endobronchial intubation is likely. The intraocular pressure and the intracranial pressures might rise, and so also nerve compressions and these odd pressure points can result. What about the reverse Trenlenberg position? If you see the head up that is shown over there, done for all upper abdominal procedures, naturally improves the lung functions but it is deleterious to the cardiac output and that might fall. And the patients are also become susceptible. Now, the second one I said was the insufflating gases. Now look at the list over here. We started off, we, we started off way back with air and oxygen. And in the 80s, when we were doing small gynae procedures, I remember using nitrous oxide. But now you see what is highlighted is CO2. And why is it highlighted? And this is the insufflating gas that is used in all cases is because what you see as the Oswald's blood gas solubility coefficient, which is a 0 0.8, a 48. The meaning of this is that of all the insufflating gases, this is the most soluble. What is the advantage of that is that by chance, if there is an inadvertent entry of this insufflating gas into a blood vessel. That means by mistake, what will happen is that this CO2 will get absorbed much faster than these other gases, and therefore the, the seriousness of embolism will be less. So what happens once CO2 is insufflated? Naturally, it may lead to hypercarbia. And there are several reasons for that. Peritoneal absorption takes place. And because of the position that we talked about, VQ mismatch might result. There may be respiratory depression if the patient is breathing spontaneously, which of course is not so, but in case. And it is also said that extraperitoneal insufflation might produce a higher CO2 level than intraperitoneal because of the extraperitoneal space not being really there. It's a potential space. And once that is being uh, used in your 
extraperitoneal surgery, say of example, hernia surgery, this space, the vessels which are there, they open up and absorption might take place. But of course, this is controversial because that's many studies have shown that the absorption is equal. So what happens when the hypercarbia might result? When we see our anesthetic technique, you will see that the minute ventilation has to be increased. And in this, we will increase the respiratory rate more rather than the tidal volume, because as we said, the compliance is reduced. Now, a very important point that we need to remember is, although the PaCO2 is rising, this PaCO2 correlates well with the entitled carbon dioxide, as you see in this diagram here, in a normal healthy patient. However, it may not be so in patients who have got um, chest problems. Now, another thing to remember is that the ETCO2 rises for a while, but plateaus after approximately 30 minutes. So it rises and then becomes a plateau. Now, if it's mild hypercarbia, it is well tolerated in a normal healthy patient. But if it is severe hypercarbia, you might have arrhythmia. What happens to the CO2 that is absorbed? There is slow mobilization back from the tissues into the blood and out it is exhaled. And CO2 itself also, which remains behind, is a cause of post-operative shoulder pain, as we'll see later. So that is what happens with the gases, which is the CO2. Now coming to the third point, this is the carboperitoneum resulting in the increased intra-abdominal pressure. And just see, no system is left out. All systems are affected by this. So let's see the first one, that is the cardiovascular system. What happens is that when peritoneal insufflation is taking place, the vagus can get stimulated. That is an important point. And it has been seen since many years that the threshold pressure, which produces minimal changes in the cardiovascular system is around 12 millimeters. It has been seen that there is a phasic change in the cardiac output, meaning thereby that if the pressures, if the intra-abdominal pressures are low, the opposing effect that takes place is that at low intra-abdominal pressure, the blood actually is pushed into the central compartment. Whereas if it is in the high intra-abdominal pressure, then it does not allow that and there is peripheral pooling. So these peripheral blood pooling. So there are two opposing effects. In low pressures, your cardiac output might increase, whereas at high intra-abdominal pressures, the cardiac output falls. And it has been seen that GA, positive pressure ventilation, and carboperitoneum can reduce the cardiac output by as much as 50%. Now, what about the respiratory system? Pressure on the diaphragm can go as high as 50 kgs with Again, all the respiratory uh, parameters fall, compliance falls, and the airway pressure rises. That's important as you see in the slide. VQ mismatch might result. Again, right main stem bronchial inflammation, and you might even have a pneumothorax and a pneumogastric if the gas leaks through the patent canals. <clears throat> what about the GI system? Of course, it raises the intra gastric pressure. However, it has been seen that the lower esophageal tone far exceeds the intragastric pressure. So thinking that the patients might be susceptible to aspiration is not true. However, all precautions are taken in high-risk, morbidly obese patients. What about the kidneys? Again, with the raised intra-abdominal pressure, during that time it has been observed that the urine output falls. However, after deflation, this urine output improves. So earlier, when patients of CKD were not accepted for laparoscopy, are now accepted, of course, keeping this in mind. Now see thromboembolism. This is the Virchow's triad, where two factors are affected in laparoscopy, that is venous stasis and hypercoagulability. However, all these, although these two factors are affected, but still embolism is not that commonly seen. And this is because the patients ambulate much faster and therefore the susceptibility is less. What about temperature variations? Yes, 
Earlier, when we were using dry, cold gases, their hypothermia could result. However, now with the availability of warm and humidified insufflating gases, this temperature loss is much less. And so also with the temperature which are maintained in the ACs in our operation theaters, this temperature loss is less. However, it has to be remembered. What about the neurohormonal stress response? Although we say that, yes, it is very minimal incisions, they say that is the wrong word to use because it is equally invasive. Only the incisions are small. And all these uh, hormones that are, are all elevated during laparoscopy. So laparoscopy is as stressful as conventional surgery. So after having seen what are all the uh, physiological changes that it can take place, Let's come to the anesthetic management. So naturally, once you've seen that, we know that the pre-anesthetic assessment has to be as uh, judiciously as we do for any other case. So all the cardiac pulmonary status has to be assessed. But remember, with the experience of all the anesthesiologists in laparoscopy, the contraindications are really very, very relative. There's hardly any patient who is refused for laparoscopy. But always remember that a conversion is possible. Again, that has reduced a lot. So in the pre-medication, always think of an anxiolytic and look at all these things that may be given. This is because as we talked about, why do we say clonidine? Because of the rise in the systemic vascular resist uh, uh, resistance and the rise in the BP, you might use that as well as it is an anxiolytic. DVT prophylaxis might be given according to the case. So depending, if you have a case like this showing this bariatric patient, you would definitely use a DVT prophylaxis. And also for the patients, onco patients or elderly patients, depending upon the hospital protocol, you might use any of these low molecular weight heparins. For monitoring, of course, it's mandatory. You have to use all these ASA monitors that are there, heart rate, NIBB, ECG, pulse ox. But these last two I have said is the IAP measuring of the intra-abdominal pressure at the uh, site where the surgeon is insufflating is absolutely important and so also the This of course, depending upon the seriousness or the uh, this thing of the patient and also of the kind of surgery that we are doing, these will be added like a urine or output, of course, if it's a major surgery and you might even do the invasive monitoring for heart and major surgical procedures. Choice of anesthesia. Again, we always write general, regional, and local. But remember, the ideal is recommended in all textbooks and for all students to know. Although you may read a whole lot of articles, but remember the choice of anesthesia is general anesthesia with controlled ventilation. And why do we say general anesthesia with intubation and controlled ventilation? because it gives a good muscle relaxation. Pneumoperitoneum is achieved at low intra-abdominal pressures. You can control the hypercarbia. It protects completely an endotracheal tube, protects completely from aspiration, good post-op uh, relief, as well as optimal conditions. So these are the reasons what go in favor of general anesthesia with tracheal intubation. Now, although I say gold standard is endotracheal intubation, yes, what we have seen nowadays is supraglottic airways have been added. Now, I have written first, gen first generation is really because, again, you should know, initially, when we had just started, we had started using LMAs for short gyne procedures. But then we had seen that it does not protect from aspiration at higher pressures. And now is the time that second generation is being used and ProSeal and iGel is being used. But again, a word of caution, this is not the gold standard and it can be used, of course, by anesthesiologists who have a very good experience in using these supraglottic airways. So general anesthesia, preloading if required, meticulously, atropine, as we said, vagal stimulation, induction aging, depending upon the technique you like, you can use either of the two, intubate, muscle relaxants, again, of course, we say it's depending choice, control ventilation, and normal cardiac is to be achieved by increasing the minute ventilation if required. And 
nasogastric tube. However, for short cases, you might put an orogastric tube, but it has to be put because at the time of Veri's needle, as you see over there in the, in the diet photograph, at that time, the stomach should not be there. And there have been instances of complications. So it's very important that should be put in all cases. A catheter to be pushed, uh, put urinary catheter if required. Now see this, slow insufflation is very important. However experienced surgeon you may be or the anesthesiologist, the dictum is slow insufflation. And it is only after a liter has gone that you can increase the flow rate. And this is especially so you must remember that is the reason that we watch the infant body pressure and the flow rate in our monitor, as you can see in the lower diaper. Gradual positioning, check the position of the tracheal tube after intubation and after positioning, pressure points, temperature, and the last line, again, slow and complete exufflation. Now, intraoperative ventilatory strategies are important. Or see all these four, volume controlled, pressure controlled ventilation, pressure controlled ventilation with volume guaranteed, positive end expiratory pressure and recruitment maneuvers. Now each and every ventilatory strategy is used, especially for the cases, especially for the type of laparoscopic surgeries we are doing. So simple cases who, which are not really very problematic and those um, uh, institutions who do not have the other modes, yes, volume controlled may be used, but always you remember with the tidal volume, you might have a peak airway pressure rise and that trauma might reside. But simple cases, short cases, you may use it. And pressure control is the one that is recommended so that you can set the uh, plateau pressure and give the tidal volume according to the ideal blood um, body weight, check the saturations and end tidal carbon dioxide, adjust the tidal volume to achieve a saturation more than 90. But this mode, of course, is available in the late, uh, latest anesthesia machines, which is the pressure controlled ventilation with volume guaranteed. That is, you're setting both the tidal volume and the Pmax. The advantage is that you are assuring the tidal volume delivery. Now, this one, that is PEEP, has been added, in, especially in the surgeries like bariatric surgery, positive and PEEP keeps the alveoli open. So, PCV along with PEEP is also given in those so it's important that these ventilatory strategies are being used for different kinds of patients. What about uh, maintenance, analgesics? You are wanting to use shorter acting analgesics naturally for better post-op pain relief in the sense that quicker recovery as daycare. Volatile anesthetics, you can use any, but desflurane has an edge over the other two, especially in the daycare surgery for a little faster recovery. Vasodilators have been recommended. It has been said that if the BP is rising because of the rise in systemic vascular resistance, it is better to give pharmacological agents like these or beta blockers rather than increasing the depth of anesthesia. Clonidine, that is your alpha agonist, can be added intraoperatively or preoperatively for both the things, lowers the BP as well as an anxiolytic. Dexmed has become very popular these days. Again, it minimizes the cardiovascular effects because it is a selective alpha-2 adrenaline receptor agonist. And it also facilitates early recover, recovery. So it is very commonly used for bariatric surgery in tropics as an adjunct to your analysis. Now, regional. Regional, I have mentioned, but remember, students, it is not that simple to have lab coli done under spinal anesthesia. Easier said, again, done by the senior most anesthesiologist. Yes, but not for you people. You have to achieve a very high sensory level of even T3 to assure that. So it is not easy. You can have problems. So it is better that you go for simpler techniques, or safer techniques, not simpler, but safer. So all these have been mentioned in the armamentarium. And lately, you will get a whole lot of cases, whole lot of publications on spinal anesthesia, but in textbooks, you will see it is always recommended GA. I'll just touch upon special scenarios, laparoscopy, ischemic heart disease, cautious preloading, slow insufflation, low flow rates, low intra-abdominal pressures, gradual positioning, monitoring, and pain relief. 
Each and every point is important. And let me tell you, if your surgeon is experienced, he knows that in ischemic heart disease, these precautions have to be taken. Now look at COPD as I was talking to you earlier. Here in COPD, entitled does not correlate with PSU2. This is the time that ABG might be essential in these. Pediatric, you might have an increased CO2 absorption as well as hypothermia may, might result. What about pregnancy? Again, you will see pregnant lady in the mid trimester. Very often nowadays we see lab polies being done under uh, this uh, in these pregnant ladies. However, you can get uh, emergencies also. So the guidelines say, yes, lab can be done. And, but the thing is you have to maintain the uteroplacental blood flow with low pressures and avoid all these, the steep reverse trend head up, avoid that, avoid hypoxia, hypocardia, acidosis. So these points have to be taken care and this is in the international guidelines of lab and pregnancy. JK surgery, very, very popular. So use agents like propofol, short acting opioids, Again, prevent post-op nausea, vomiting, and proceed again. Now, coming to the COVID-19, yes, when it started, there was a lot of talk that is peritoneal fluid, does it contain viral load? There were some things said yes, some said no. And since laparoscopic still continued, these were a few things that were used at that time. There was a filter, as you see in this figure over here, which absorbed the aerosolized particles, as well as on the right side, if you see, again, the CO2 was put through into a liquid so that did not uh, distinct the atmosphere. Post-op pain, in laparoscopic surgery, remember it is due to parietal, visceral, and shoulder pain. Parietal, visceral, it is understandable. Now, shoulder pain is basically due to residual CO2, which remains in the uh, abdomen. That is the reason they say complete exsufflation. This forms carbonic acid and it irritates the subdiaphragmatic space and also due to the neuropraxia because of the stretch of the phrenic. It can be very excruciating and all these methods are used to prevent post-op pain right, right from the port site. Remember, it's not only the port site, but even the subfacial layers that are. Subdiaphragmatic installation with bupivacaine, very popular. Even peritoneal installation of levobupivacaine is there. So basically, for any procedure, multimodal analgesia is the answer. Post-operative nausea, vomiting, yes, distended stomach, peritoneal insufflation, bowel manipulation are all causes of POND, and therefore you need to have all um, drugs that are available may be used at different times, and also your anesthetic technique prevents it. A few, a few words on complications which you must know as students, surgical instrumentation, insufflating gas, which is the carbon dioxide, and due to the raised intra-abdominal pressure. Remember, bradycardia, suddenly at the time of insufflation, bradycardia can result. That is the time you have to stop the insufflation, inform your uh, surgeon, atropine might, need, might be needed and desufflate. So that Secondly, subcutaneous emphysema can result. At the end of surgery, you see that the patient is all puffy, puffy. And why? Perhaps especially it is seen in extraperitoneal dissection. So for this, what is you have to remember is the airway pressures at entitled carbon dioxide might rise and you might feel a crepitus. Answer is don't worry, you just continue post-operative ventilation till the crepitus disappears and then your entire and the ABG improves. And that is the time that it, you will have no problem, but do not extubate earlier. Capnothorax can result because of the patent pleuroperitoneal canals, because of the congenital defect in the diaphragm. And you can, especially in fundoplication. Again, remember, especially when you're doing fundoplication, if there's a sudden fall in the saturation and rise in the CO2, think about it. And the surgeon can actually see it. The, immobility of the hemidiaphragm. Again, don't worry, discontinue nitrous oxide. If you are using, give 100% oxygen, continue positive pressure ventilation. Do not unnecessarily put an ICD. That's 
And the last complication, which is the most dreaded, is the venous air embolism. At the time of Veri's needle insertion, you might have a momentary rise, which you will not see in the carbon dioxide, but the entidal carbon dioxide falls, profound hypotension, and a mini burma. So that is a catastrophe, and that is the time you have to manage immediately. Again, stop insufflation, 100% oxygen, give the durance position, resuscitate, and all measures to uh, you should ask for help. So that to end my lecture, or to tell your stu the students, you must know the path of all the physiological changes. And a few more things that be safe, go gradual, insufflate, exufflate. Monitoring is very, very important. And I'm sure you will all do very well. Thank you very much. Hello, ma'am. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, madam, for the detailed presentation. And it was, it was a very nice presentation, madam, has covered almost uh, all of the uh, areas. Uh, madam, uh, I am uh, say, asking some of the questions that has come in the chat box. Huh? Yes, please. Do you think uh, chest X-ray is essential for patient undergoing laparoscopic surgery? And what are the criteria for chest X-ray? See, chest X-ray in an ASC-1 young patient is not required, right? So if you have a lab coli patient coming who is 30 years, it's not required at all. Clinically, you see the patient and it's not necessary. However, if the ASA is higher and you've got some other major surgery like we do for any other surgery, then it will be recommended. Not otherwise. If it's a COPD, yes, you will get. If it's a patient undergoing some onco, uh, she's an elderly lady going undergoing some ovarian laparoscopic, yes, you will. But a young, healthy, normal surgery going on, you will not. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. The another question is, you have mentioned about the selective spinal anesthesia. Can you please give the details? Selective spinal anesthesia, of course, is only very, uh, this thing um, only for the books that basically they say is give a very, very small dose, actually speaking, give a very small dose and then turn the patient accordingly and give and accordingly do that. But really I've never practiced it. And so I'm not uh, very um, comfortable with that. So it's giving a very small dose, turning the patient accordingly, a head low or head, head low so that you achieve that or a head up. So, but I've never practiced it. Okay, ma'am. Uh, any role for combining spinal anesthesia with the general anesthesia for laparoscopic hysterectomy? Uh, again, what is spinal it? Anesthesia. Any role for combining spinal anesthesia with the general anesthesia for laparoscopic hysterectomy? Well, I don't, yeah, but what is the idea of giving a spinal anesthesia? I really don't understand. Except there are some uh, surgeons who are doing a in extensive laparoscopic surgery. And they feel if we give an epidural, maybe their intestines are a little contracted or something. And they sometimes ask for it. But otherwise, there's one surgeon who asks for that, not the others. So the only reason an epidural is given, really not, uh, not necessarily spinal, but that is the only reason for the surgeon, not, not otherwise. Unless you give an epidural for post-op pain relief, undergoing a major surgery, not major otherwise. Surgery. Okay, so as such... So spinal anesthesia does not require combining with the gel. Not, not necessary. It's only the surgeons who sometimes ask for that. But what Ma about that? Could I, just, question? could I just interrupt one minute? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, okay, yes. Okay, Ma'am, uh, ma extensively in our um, uh, hospital, we have uh, done a lot of uh, spinals combined with uh, GA and laparoscopy with just spinals, depending on the uh, expertise of the surgeon. And many a times we have found that uh, it's it's giving good results. Of course, we can't do it for all the surgeons, but uh, we are very selective. And second thing is, um, they have asked about the role of spinal here. Uh, Ma'am, that uh, you do get a good control of the blood pressure and uh, the amount of drugs and the inhalational anesthetic agents that we need to give uh, comes down drastically. And some of them take around uh, maybe two hours or uh, more in uh, difficult hysterectomies and all that. And uh, I have personally found that uh, it's, it's quite uh, a good technique to combine the two of them together. 
You're right, Nandi, this is what I said, depends on the expertise of the, uh, of the anesthesiologist. And surely, that, as you said, and we only do it if the surgeon asks. Otherwise, I mean, it, it just depends. You can do anything for that matter. And as you said, we were, give, uh, you know, we were trying out under regional uh, tap repair of hernia. And you won't believe what used to happen if, and even though the surgeon was very good, if by chance he breached the peritoneum, He's doing extra peritoneum and he breaches the peritoneum and the patient becomes very restless because the gas becomes intraperitoneal. So that's the only thing, of course, definitely, I'm sure you can do, uh, with, like they say, you rather than having the BP by inhalation agents, you can do pharmacologically. So all things are uh, possible, but I feel for the students, the book says general anesthesia. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And what about gastrous laparoscopy? Again, yes. Yes, yeah, it is there in the textbooks, and but not really practiced because it's not that easy in the sense you need special retractors for it because after all, there is no gas. So you need those special instruments to retract and the exposure is really not that good. So it is there in the books, but we, some surgeons tried many years ago, but we are not practicing it now. Basically, the exposure is not good and you need that special retractors. Uh, Ma'am, we are um, actually we, now we are practicing in very uncertain times of uh, the COVID uh, virus uh, pandemic. And uh, it has been studied that the HIV and papilloma virus and conibacterium all have been found in the plumes. And uh, of course, we are not yet sure about the COVID virus. But then uh, probably the surgeons uh, should be, I mean, the anesthesiologist should be aware that in case the surgeons do not know the technique in the sense, how are they going to prevent the contamination of the theater and the contamination to the OT personnel? I think we need to educate them about it because some of them, now we are very lax with the surgeons. You see when the trocas are being interchanged or, uh, you know, they're removing the trochas. There's a lot of, uh, you know, the sudden gush of the plumes coming out and we are not thinking about it because now we feel the pandemic is dying down, but then it's still very much a reality. And also uh, there are times that, uh, you know, uh, when uh, we are trying to close, there are times when you have not yet deflated completely and uh, still we are infecting the atmosphere of the OT. So having the HEPA filters and uh, all those filtration methods, I think is very important right now in these times, because I think all patients should be viewed with a little bit of suspicion also at these times, because- Absolutely, Absolutely Nalini, you're so right. And we have to keep on educating our surgeons all the time for everything for that matter. <laughs> they are always likely to forget and they become, <laughs> Rashmi is also smiling. So that is so important. We have to keep on reminding. Uh, the one advantage on. for us uh, is that we are seeing all the surgeons. That's the advantage, madam. We know what are the each and every surgery is doing when we are seeing all the cases yes, of yes. the different Absolutely. surgeons and the, every day that we are seeing. That's yes. why you can understand it. Very true. Very true. Okay, madam. Mm -hmm. Uh, regional with the GA is very popular in smaller setups, especially before dexamethasone was introduced. Did innumerable um, cases as patient is very stable yeah, yes. and the drug requirement uh, reduces a lot. That must be a consultant who is commenting, not a student. This is... Uh, is that comment? Yes, yes, this is... Yeah, yeah I, I'm telling you. You see, whenever we say you can do a procedure with anything what that you know whatsoever so but i thought this is mainly for the pgs and that is what they should know they can't go and tell in an exam proceed you know the an examiner who has not used proceed will never pass him it's very clear unless he gives you a hint and says have you used that that time otherwise i don't know i i feel the teaching should be what the books say otherwise you can do anything anyway you know there's no stopping at all you just cross the border of haryana of delhi and everybody's and then occasionally we get a case of a cardiac arrest and then they come to our so i i'm basically pointing out to the students this is what they should answer in the exam madam um uh... Madam, any adjustment for the IAP pressure for in, infants and children? Intraabdominal yes, pressure? Yes, for? yes, yes. 8 to 10. Lower eight pressure. Yes. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. I think Dr. Nalini, we can, shall we pass on to the next topic? 
Madam, yes. you have done you. very nicely. Fantastic, ma'am. Jai Shri Ma'am. It is Thank excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, bye. So now we are passing on to the next topic that is uh, by uh, acute postoperative pain uh, by uh, Major General Dr. Rashmi Datta. Madam, uh, she's the Major uh, Rashmi Datta. And she's a senior consultant in anesthesiology at uh, uh, headquarters Delhi area, medical branch. And uh, coming to her uh, publications, she has uh, books that is fluid therapy at your fingertips and critical care therapy at your fingertips. These are the books for her. And the chapters, there are about 12 chapters in different books. And she has about 45 purpose published as the first author. And her achievements are the Chief of Army Staff Commendation in 2002 and 2012, and the Chief of AA Staff Commendation in 2014 and BSM in 2016. And the only, uh, her achievements are the only defense anesthesiologist who is a fellow of Indian College of Anesthesiologist. And she represented India in the Cobra Gold Exercise, International Disaster Management Exercise with the Indo-Pacific Command of USA and uh, 12 other countries. Now, Madam, I invite you to present your topic on acute pain, postoperative pain management. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. At the onset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ventagri and uh, all the uh, people from uh, ISA Kerala who have uh, invited me today. Thank you really very much. And uh, also would like to appreciate this particular uh, session, which is, uh, uh, you know, with the, uh, all women there on Women's Day. Very nice. Uh, I had uh, put my uh, the thing. I, uh, can my uh, slide be, uh, my PowerPoint be shared? Dr. Uh, Binil? Uh, shall I share the PowerPoint, madam? Yeah, please, please. Hello. Yeah. So, uh, I'll be talking about the management of acute post-operative pain. Uh, this is, uh, 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 especially for the PG students, I thought it was a very good, uh, good uh, topic, which uh, they should uh, be able to understand, because this is something which uh, all of us face. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Can it... How do I move the slide, please? I'll move, I'll move. Okay, please. Next slide, please. Go step for a second. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, pain is a subjective ex uh, experience which cannot be measured. That is the unfortunate part of the whole thing. And one person's pain may not be, will be very difficult with the other person's pain. But a general definition which has been given, it is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or even potential tissue damage and anything else described in terms of this type of damage. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. It will take a few seconds to come to the next slide. Okay. Let me go. And I am going. Can you share from your end? I'm trying that. Yeah, I can. How do I share it? I have this open oh. over here. Now it's working. Please. Please okay. proceed. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's not complete. Uh, now, what exactly I want to uh, bring it out over here. Next slide, please. If you can, uh, the same. Yeah. Uh, since it is uh, for the PG's nociception is to injure and to be pain painful. Now, what, when you have this, it's a very complex interaction which comes from between the signaling, the signaling systems. There is modulation from the higher uh, centers and there is individual perception also. Next slide, please. 
Um, Post-operative pain, when we talk about it, what is the definition of pain? We talk about based on only three characters. Firstly, the symptoms, whether it is the mechanisms and whether it is associated with any syndrome. There are three major classes of pain which have been given. One is nociceptive pain and one is inflammatory pain. And the, both of these are due to stimulation of the nociceptors. And then there is neuropathic pain. Now, this pain is chronic pain. I'll not be dealing with this today. Uh, this is chronic pain, the pathophysiological consequences of the multiple changes which take place uh, after nerve injury. Next slide, please. Now, why do we need to treat pain? Uh, it is not just that the patient is uncomfortable. There is definite uh, physiological effects which take place, like in CVS, you have tachycardias, uh, your respiratory system is involved, the person is not able to breathe very deeply, and hence, uh, atelectasis, GI, there is uh, uh, ileus, there is uh, anastomo um, uh, anastomotic failure, the hypercoagulable state develops, which leads to predisposes the patient to DVT, there is impaired immunological state, there is anxiety, which can have long-term effect after that. And uh, subsequent, there is a, the uh, possibility of a chronic post-operative surgery pain, which is an entirely different uh, topic, very difficult to treat. And once a patient suffers from it, it is rather, uh, 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 it is very painful for the patient too. Next slide, please. So, uh, and when it comes uh, from the patient's point of view, from the healthcare to the same, there is a low morale, professional dissatisfaction, there are complaints galore, and the possibility of litigation is there. So coming on to, next slide, so coming on to the point, whether are we actually, uh, uh, are we doing a good job? One thing we are very sure about it, pain must be treated, but we are not doing a good job about it. And acute post-operative pain even till date remains under managed because it is an individual requirement and it's high time we understand this. Next slide, please. So coming on to the pain, uh, pain pathways, just a brief uh, uh, thing about that. Next slide. Now, pain when it goes, actually comes when it, uh, as it goes up in the central nervous system uh, from the peripheral to the central nervous system, it comes in three steps, transduction, transmission, and modulation, which takes place either it is up or down re uh, regulation. Now the transduction which takes place is a very complex uh, chemical and electronic activity which takes place, which is there, not in the synaptic cliffs, anything beyond the synaptic cliffs pre or before is transduction. Transmission is the neurotransmitter action which takes place at the synaptic cleft, which comes over there. And both these things along the entire channel are modulated. Next slide. So we have the first order uh, uh, neurons which are there, which are present, uh, which are, as you can see over here, the nociceptive uh, fibers and the, the alpha fibers and the C, uh, the A fibers and the C fibers. All of them, as you can see, come over here. They come and join over here. These are this lamina of reed, which you one when you are appearing for an exam, you should at least be able to tell. The one of importance to us uh, in pain is substantia gelatinosa. Next slide, please. Uh, is over here, which comes here in the substantia gelatinosa and or it comes in this right in the center where the ventral nucleus is also there. These lamina are the ones which are important. Next slide, please. So these are where the second uh, order uh, of the uh, uh, these uh, uh, the neurons come in. These are two of them, uh, two main areas which are there. One of them is substantia gelatinosa, that is the gray horn, and uh, then the nucleus proprius. We just should know where are they present in the uh, for, for theory. We require to know this. Next slide, please. Now coming on to the principles of pain management. Next slide. Now the pain management, which are there, there are various types of uh, drugs which are available at present. Our armamentarium is very large now. The pharmacological techniques which we can we can use for post-operative immediate post-operative pain are uh, non-opioids, opioids, any regional blocks, which includes even I'll talk about the central block, which is the epidural, and the various adjuvants which we can use. 
There's also your non-pharmacological techniques which can be used such as acupuncture, hypnosis, psychotherapy, but depending on the surgery, you can use these. Next slide. Now, when we talk about nociception and the management techniques, the four process techniques, wherever we, uh, what we had said as the, the process of pain, we block all this. And as you can see in the slide also here, it is transduction, you can uh, tackle that. That is your NA, um, uh, uh, NSAIDs and your L uh, local anesthetics. The transmission can be blocked with various nerve blocks. And today we can very nicely say that uh, if there is a nerve, you can block it. Uh, everything is possible. Modulation of this is at various levels in the form of various drugs such as opioids, clonidine, dexmedobidine. All these drugs can be used to modify uh, the, uh, uh, the pain, the uh, sensation of pain. And then the perception, either with the form of right at the, uh, uh, the uh, the presence of the cerebral cortex over here, uh, opioids, ac uh, acetaminophen, that is paracetamol, your alpha-2 agonist, and a whole lot of other drugs which are there. Next slide, please. So the principles of pain management, when we talk about it, we talk basically in terms of preemptive analgesia, preventive analgesia, opioid sparing analgesia, which is normally taken as polypharmacy analgesia, and then comes to the multi modal and in India, which is what we really should follow. Now, when we talk about polypharmacy, we talk about the use of multiple medications, sometimes more than which are therapeutically necessary. They use multiple medications, maybe from the same class or have a similar mechanism of action. And uh, they have a potential to be inappropriate. So polypharmacy, if you use multiple opioids or you use multiple uh, NSAIDs, is the uh, chances of uh, having excessive uh, use of these drugs, excessive administration with the potential side effects is there. Multimodal comes back to the classical um, uh, Kreis method of uh, balanced anesthesia. That is, we are coming back to that. So multimodal is based on a rational combination of uh, you know, different analgesics with different routes of delivery, uh, different uh, techniques which can be used to provide a method which is safe and more effective. And we are heading on for an opioid sparing pain management. Why we talk about opioid sparing? Because of the side effects of opioids, which everybody knows, which requires a little bit more monitoring, which may not be possible in bigger centers. The constant monitoring, which is required for the side effects of opioids. Next slide, please. So the advantages of a multimodal approach is that not only it optimizes your pain relief, but it reduces the side effect burden, uh, which is important. Uh, there, it also provides synergistic and additive effects. The lower dose of each medication is needed and it prevents central sensitization. As you can see in the slide over here, multimodal approach needs, uh, uses a whole lot of um, uh, drugs, all in different combinations which can be used. Next slide. Now, the variation in uh, analgesic requirement is there. This depends upon the site and the size of surgery. It depends upon the age and the gender. Uh, it uh, depends also on various psychological factors, the preconditioning of the patient, the pharmacokinetic variability and the pharmacodynamic variability. The same surgery may require in different patients, uh, the requirement of the uh, pain relief may be different. It should be individualized. Post-operative pain cannot be given as a, a blanket uh, regime which can cover up everything. It has to be individualized depending on the mechanism of pain, the location, the type of surgical approach, even the surgical uh, skill of uh, the skills of the surgeon and also the expected duration of pain. Next slide, please. Now, Coming on to the last part, the expected duration of pain, we have an idea about the type of operations. Like upper abdomen normally the take about uh, 48 to 72 hours. We expect that the opioid will be, uh, be used. It will be severe pain during that time. It will come down uh, later. Thoracotomies, they take the maximum. Limb and uh, uh, body wall surgeries are little less. So depending on that, the use of opioids to be kept bare minimum and to be switched over immediately with other alternative drugs. Alternatively, you can use, instead of opioids, you can use some other techniques so that the uh, opioid sparing effect is there. Now, uh, just a brief uh, mention about the various types of drugs. Next slide, please. 
uh, is the non-opioids or the NSAIDs. Normally, these are the first line of treatment. Among these, though, for convenience sake, though paracetamol is not an NSAID, but uh, it is normally clubbed along with that. It is basically an analgesic, being a central COX inhibitor only and not a peripheral COX inhibitor. But uh, all the NSAIDs are, uh, uh, they have no physical dependence, they have no tolerance, but most important, they have a ceiling effect. And most important beyond that is the type of side effects which are present over there. The, risk, uh, the um, contraindications, related contraindications are quite a bit, and one has to keep in mind where you give uh, NSAIDs. Uh, especially in COVID times, one has to be a little careful about the use of NSAIDs and there comes paracetamol or uh, acetaminophen, which comes back as the first line of treatment. Next slide, please. This is just a list of the various drugs which are available, which um, uh, are there. Uh, for the PG students, what I would advise is that uh, familiarize yourself with one or two of the drugs or maybe three drugs and know all the indications, their complications, their side effects, their dosage and the duration of action. Next slide, please. This is a rough estimate of when the peak levels take place, the half-life, the onset of duration. It is not possible to remember the, the all these details of uh, all the medicines available does but at least few of them we should be very very familiar with them and we should know all the duration the onset the maximum dose for uh, being a safe anesthesiologist next slide please we have two parenteral uh, uh, nsas that is a ketorolac and ibuprofen which are available with us and again same thing the side effects should be known to you next the same we have uh, opioids and they're classified in various types as strong opioids, partial opioids, weak opioids, and antagonists. And uh, these are the types, some of these like propoxyphen are no longer used, no, no longer advised, but for the sake of listing them down, we have just listed them here. Most of us depend upon fentanyl, and uh, that's a shorter acting, easily controllable drug where uh, the same remifentanil is not available in many places. Uh, morphine is good, especially when you're doing some cardiac or, uh, uh, you know, long ca uh, cases where the thorax is involved. Over there, morphine can be used, provided you can monitor the patient. Pentazocene is preferred usually by the surgeons, basically because of the lesser side effects. Buprenorphin is a very wonderful drug, but you should know the duration of action is very long and uh, one has to require a lot of monitoring with that. Next slide, please. Next slide. These are the various, um, uh, the range and the type of, uh, uh, if you could just go back, please, uh, of the adjuvants which are available. As you can make out over here, we have a long list of them. And uh, some of them are being used, uh, uh, either they're being used orally, they're being used part of the pre-medication, they're being used as part of uh, intrathecal, uh, when you give uh, uh, along with the nerves to uh, nerve blocks to prolong the duration of nerves, nerve blocks, they're all being used at various levels and they target the pain sensation at levels. Next slide, please. Now coming on to the various type of nerve blocks which uh, uh, one can do. It's a very simple technique. One, these to, uh, to whom it may concern type of nerve blocks, no identifiable nerve there block, but it is uh, depending upon uh, the whole area which is there, which with the number of nerves, uh, which is a classical example is your tab block, where which we uh, use um, uh, very frequently for post-operative pain relief. And uh, it is very adequately, uh, uh, it is a very, very satisfying block where uh, we can, uh, uh, where we find good relief after especially abdominal surgeries. Next uh, slide, please. Then comes your nerve blocks, which are uh, plexus, uh, which includes the plexus blocks, which means that when one injection goes to a multiple uh, number of blocks, uh, number of nerves, which are blocked by giving only one single injection because the uh, group of nerves are uh, within a, uh, they are within a sheath. So cervical, brachial, all of us are very familiar with brachial plexus block and the lumbar and the sacral, which can be used. Apart from that, the peripheral nerve blocks which are used are many and uh, we can use that. Uh, the next slide, please. 
Usually in the peripheral nerve blocks, the intraoperative and postoperative in Ingevia, it is targeted as per the site of location. Uh, we have tried to use many blocks um, and with catheters now. So a brachial plexus block with a catheter and uh, uh, adductor canal block, many blocks which you can use, which can give continuous, uh, either if you put place in a catheter for continuous infusion of LAs and opioids with a mixture of both of them. And uh, this gives you good pain relief. Next uh, slide, please. Now, a brief word about uh, uh, recent advances and recent concepts which are coming in there. PDLA, that is a prolonged delivery of uh, local anesthetic agents. We have got nanoparticles, nano um, technology is coming in this, either it's albumin or chitosan, uh, uh, you know, encapsulated with an initial burst and following with that, if it is in a form of multiple layers, it comes in and there's a quasi linear type of release. Uh, the duration it completes some some of these which are uh, coming up now are up to three months to six months also which is quite uh, uh, you can have pain relief for that and uh, the new ones which are coming in there uh, uh, the nano shells are being modified so now we'll have already we have nanoparticles coming in for uh, bupivacaine and now we have this you now for your different types of uh, pain relief here the issue of persistent post-surgical pain is uh, an important consideration whenever we talk about uh, pain relief post-operative. This is the entity which uh, normally develops, which uh, uh, the, one of the theories for its development is that uh, when there is um, uh, the pain, acute post-op pain is not adequately managed and this will carry on persisting for long. There may be a, a, a neuroma which may develop over there. Uh, there may be other causes also, but one of the most uh, frequently given theories is that the acute post-op pain was not managed. So one, uh, this becomes, this is very resistant to treatment and requires a lot of management three to uh, normally taken after two months, any pain which persists after two months. And this is a very prolonged chronic pain, which is, which I'm not dealing with just now. The epigenetic processes can also be modified so that it does not develop into chronic pain. The uh, acute post-op pain does not develop into chronic pain. So therefore, uh, next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. So therefore, the therapeutic approach to energy, the combination, ideal combination, which comes in is type and degree of pain and the patient's perception. So when a person, when we meet the person, uh, the patient in the uh, pre-op uh, period, uh, we meet them, the concept of pain or the perception of pain should be observed. The underlying medical, social, and environmental conditions have to be kept in mind so that we know how we will tackle this. And it has to be the pain relief has to be custom made for each patient. On-demand administration, which was there, is now being replaced by a continuous or regular scheduling pain so that patient does not get breakthrough pain in between. As the energetic requirement diminish, we have to transit from parenteral to oral. It, it, it uh, starts with the parenteral switches over to oral and usually first you give an opioid and then we replace it with a, a non-opioid uh, combination starting with uh, in between. The combination of various analgesic methods uh, we are uh, using that is the balanced or multimodal uh, analgesia at best for mild pain what is normally suggested is either paracetamol or uh, acetaminophen and um, or NSAIDs. Uh, and for severe pain, we go over to opioids and then we try other methods also. Next slide, please. Preemptive and uh, uh, analgesic for major surgeries, we try this uh, preemptive and uh, or preventive analgesia in which we give adjuvants are normally given in the pre-op uh, period as part of the pre-medication. And after induction, we either put in an um, epidural, caudal, lumbar, whatever it is, depending on the site for intraoperative and postoperative uh, analgesia. Site-specific local infiltrations are done. Uh, local infiltrations, I uh, include even the cap block. Post-operatively, IV non-opioids and opioids can be given either as patient-controlled uh, analgesia or as continuous infusions with additives such as clonidine or um, uh, opioids in the local anesthetics. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is just a picture, uh, a diagram uh, type of thing, uh, giving an example. 
nothing uh, uh, you know uh, sacrosanct about it but this is just a this thing like if there's mild intensity pain such as the form of herniotomies or varicose veins these are the type of uh, uh, pain relief can be used moderate intensity you use uh, uh, you know they suggest paracetamol or wound infiltration peripheral nerve blocks and pca and when there is severe intensity pain these are the ones which are normally recommended next slide please Now, example of uh, evidence-based procedural pain management. Next slide. Do we need to do all this? We have got various, uh, next slide, please. We have various examples of uh, how people have uh, uh, treated them. Uh, next slide. You can go over to the next slide also. Yeah, various studies which have shown that uh, whenever you talk about uh, uh, ERAS, which is the uh, current uh, way of managing the post-operative uh, period, uh, now over here the evidence-based surgery, the, the evidence-based alternatives to epidurals which are given over there, it is not just one particular thing. We have a lot of uh, things available with us and this is what uh, is recommended that we can try out everything. Now here I wanted to take, next slide please, I wanted to take um, uh, this opportunity to talk about acute pain services. What I want to tell our PG students is that we have got a large amount of drugs which we can use, but how do we give them to the patients? This is where the acute pain services come. Uh, we had um, started, next slide, uh, as per the International Association of Pain, uh, it, was, it is an in-house organization that ensures optimal pain uh, management for every patient that undergoes surgery, including children and including those people who have uh, uh, ambulatory surgeries. And it is a consultative surgery that is called upon by a patient's primary care team to help manage pain, even when it is for non-surgical cases, which includes things like cancer pain, major burn pain, and all these. Next slide. So this acute pain services we had started, we have started this normally, uh, both in RR and base, we have this one dedicated resident is placed every fortnightly under the guidance of the faculty anesthesiologist on call. Uh, we gave him a bag and uh, uh, in the bag, there were many things like including the Baxter, uh, uh, we use the pump. Uh, we have got uh, the pain, uh, like over here, you can see this, this is the uh, uh, you know visual analog scale the call, uh, telephone call, then a whole lot of uh, other uh, epidural catheters, everything, everything was provided in this APS bag, nicely colored so that it is, uh, you know, seen right from uh, far away that it is there. Next slide, please. The bag normally contained analgesic medicines, which include, which are the commonly used ones, which include bupivacaine, ropivacaine, morphine, all the possible things, including uh, ondansetron and phenargan, which we used. Now, yeah, emergency drugs were also kept over there, BP in, uh, equipment and uh, the pulse oximeter was kept. And we had made about five forms uh, for the uh, acute pain services protocol. All these forms, one to five, were color-coded, custom-designed. Next slide, please. So in this, we also made our own APS manual. The patients who required high quality relief, pain relief were identified right from the time when they were uh, having their operation. Uh, in the surgery, the, uh, uh, when the uh, pain relief was decided, the form was filled, the, uh, the technique was given. And depending on the type of pain relief, which we required post-op, whether it's an epidural, opioid-related, PCA, uh, we also had another form for labor and interior and uh, one form for uh, the instructions to the nursing staff. The APS resident was informed through an allocation board, which was kept right in the center of the operation theater, where anybody who would put in an epidural also or any other uh, catheter or anything would, it would be give, uh, uh, the name would be placed over there. Uh, patients were followed from the day of initiation of the uh, uh, of the protocol four to six hourly till the cessation of the protocol. That is from the insertion of the epidural catheter till removal, we have the, the uh, APS uh, um, resident, he followed it. Next slide. 
This is one, uh, I've just taken a picture and put it over here of one of the forms. This is form one, in which uh, this was regional anesthesia infusion form. And as you can make out, it's a very detailed, both the sides are over there. It's a very detailed form where in which everything, what is the lockout period, the infusion rate, everything was given over there, including all the complications which could possibly come and uh, 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 what are the uh, problems which can be faced. So it is a very detailed form, similar like this, we had other three forms too. Next slide, please. So this uh, APS form was filled up very diligently with all the details. Any deviation which was necessary by the patient's requirement was also documented and underlined. Periodic uh, assessment along with this, the form five was given in which the nursing staff would do the periodic assessment of the vital parameters. And in that, we also had the sedation score, the pain score, all everything, whatever was given, was recorded over there meticulously. Next slide, please. The uh, uh, ward was always, all the wards were informed to inform the APS resident in case of inadequate pain relief, excessive sedation, abnormal vitals, if there was urinary tension, anything, any of the possible complications which could take place were told to be informed to the APS resident, the number was given, it was given in all the wards. And we also made an APS manual, that means we put down all the points, whatever could give, to give clear instructions as to how to handle unusual events. The residents had, or all the residents had that. Next. For surgical cases, we offered a whole lot of, um, uh, you know, blocks. Uh, Non-surgical, we had uh, labor anesthesia. It, it was integrated with the chronic pain uh, uh, management uh, uh, pain uh, clinic, which we had. And uh, for futures, which we, uh, procedures, which we thought that we will try to add in future was in, included patient control and anesthesia. But because of our lack of manpower, basically we uh, stopped at that only. Uh, we faced a few, next uh, slide please, we faced a few teething problems. Uh, one of them was that rescue NLG, there, including narcotics, were given to the patient without consulting the APS resident and without documentation. Uh, this was given either by the instructions, because of the instructions given by the surgeons directly to the nursing staff, and uh, they would give the rescue NLG. They're without talking to us that we can up or down the uh, uh, infusions. Uh, nursing staff also, there was inadequate monitoring and charting uh, in the initial phases because they maintained their own charting and our charts were not being maintained. Now, sometimes uh, some adventurous people also went on and increased, decreased or stopped the epidural infusions or the uh, catheters which were placed in their chronic uh, continuous infusions, they stopped them without informing the APS uh, resident. And uh, many times he would come over there and find that uh, the catheter has been taken out. Uh, lack of electronic monitoring on occasions also did hamper a few cases, but these are all surmountable. And what happened later was that um, we, uh, once they uh, understood that the APS resident is sincere, he will be there and he's doing his rounds in the evening, these gradually stop. But these are the initial challenges which we faced. Next slide, please. So actually, does APS help? It does. We found that it does. They were more satisfied with the lower levels of pain, had lesser incidence of side effects, and they were discharged definitely from the hospital. We also had a fewer cases of people coming back on the second or the third uh, uh, reporting afterwards, subsequent. Uh, so that there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we'd like to think that the chronic pains were absolutely decreased with this. APS had a considerable impact on the pain uh, management in the surgical wards. Uh, yes, uh, there was an initial uh, problem, like I said, about the surgeons giving their level of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the pain relief. Uh, then subsequently, they started asking us, Ki yours uh, definitely does help. So uh, with this, I would like to, uh, next slide, please. So from uh, pain, what I would like to say is, if you could just click on it, please. Next slide, please. So it became no pain. So very important uh, post-operative pain management, the carry home message, which I'd like people to take over is that acute pain management ha has to be there. It has to be integrated into the uh, you know, post-operative instructions which are given by the surgeons. And we have to take a step 
uh, in front so that we can go there. We have to show our presence to make sure uh, that, uh, you know, the pain uh, is being adequately done. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. Uh, we will uh, continue with the next session. After that, at the end, we will dis um, we will do the discussion, ma'am. Please wait, ma'am. Thank you. Nalini, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Anita, that was an excellent uh, talk, and I'm sure we have lots to discuss once uh, Rushali also uh, gets done with the the presentation. And uh, that's uh, that was a request by the organizers. And uh, so on to uh, introduction of uh, Dr. Rishali Ponde. Uh, I'm sure she does not need, actually doesn't need any introduction whatsoever, uh, but it's cursory. So here I go. She's a national president and founder secretary Academy of Regional Anesthesia India. And she's also the formal, sec uh, formal secretary of Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists. She's a former secretary. Um, and she's also the program head of World Federation the Society of Anesthesia and uh, Children's Anesthesia Services. Also of ISA, Pediatric Regional Anesthesia Fellowship. And uh, this is in Mumbai. She's a mentor for AURA and CAS Pediatric Regional Anesthesia Postdoctoral Fellowship. She's a director of Children's Anesthesia Services in Mumbai, and she's very active in regional and pediatric anesthetic uh, services in Mumbai. And she has three additions uh, to her credit. One is uh, illustrated manual of USGRA, that's anesthesia in adults and children. And she's more than 50 international and national research publications. And she's also among the top docs, uh, according to India Today, 2018, 19, and 20. So with that, over to you, uh, Dr. Rishali. I don't see her on. I, I am very much here yes. now. Oh, yes, 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 I yes. reflexly wore okay. my own specs when you said you can't see me. <laughs> Sorry. <No. laughs> All right. OK. Nalini, while you were introducing, I almost was beholden. Thank you very much for that very kind and benevolent introduction. Uh, well, I have given my talk pre-recorded to Benil, and I guess it's precisely 17 minutes. So those who, um, those who are interested in pediatric regionals, because nothing can be done in only, on, only half an hour for pediatric regionals. I've just given a zest of what can be done, uh, just a glimpse of what could what could really go up from here. So over to Benil. I hope, Benil, you have the video to put it on. Thank you. Say, I, I love uh, movies. And I'm going to sh share with you a very interesting clip of a movie from a movie called Term of Endearment. And look what happens. This lady's daughter is being operated and see what happens to her in the post-operative period. Very interesting. Well, not all mothers or all families may be as vociferous as this vibrant actor. But yes, they all go through a similar plight when they see their children in acute untreated pain. And today, the best modality we have to treat pain is, is regional anesthesia, surely in pediatric population. So we in this next 20 minutes to go, we are going to look at it in a very nutshell just to see the scope and play of the subject. 
why do we really go after pediatric anesthesia? Because this is one of the best modalities to handle perioperative pain, the best tools that we have. It's very balanced because it adds analgesia to anesthesia, very profound analgesia as such. So it really balances out the whole job. It's economical, lesser PICO stay. Lesser stay in the hospitals have been proved it's scientific in the sense, apart from the most tangible benefit of analgesia, there are certain other subtle benefits, such as a positive metabolic response, a positive immunologic response, a positive uh, response towards neuro behavioral changes, because there is, there is less pain in the perioperative period that they experience. Uh, hypovascular uh, field, so lesser blood loss, or there are many other positive impact of regional anesthesia other than analgesia. So yes, it's a beneficial work and it's time tested. Time and again, we have proved the safety of this. The slide is busy, I know, but we are here discussing what all blocks are possible. Whatever is possible in an adult is possible in a neonate and the modalities are almost similar. However, the indications have to be appropriate and the exact expertise that is required to perform these blocks in small kids have to be around. Having said this, let us see the most common blocks that one need to know in pediatric population. To begin with, of course, is the first good old caudal epidural block where the baby is kept in lateral position. And of course, uh, the posterior superior iliac spines are palpated, the sacrococcus, the the sacral corno is identified, the skin subcutaneous tissue and the sacrococcal ligament is pierced, the give is experienced, the calculated local anesthetic dose is injected. Now here, we, there are certain special needles with stilets as well, so that we can prevent the skin tissue getting inside straight into the epidural space. We can use ultrasound here too. So this is the longitudinal axis. Here is the, this is the dural sac and you will see the needle coming in here. As I told you, these are only glimpses. We can't go into details of each block. So this is how it would uh, look like when we start injecting. This is the dural sac and this is the needle. If we are, you're training students, you can show them every time they insert, especially in very small babies. So this is, you, you will see that the drug displaces the posterior and the anterior dura and ascends in the central neuroaxial conduit. What we can also do is we can actually wait at the surgically congruent into vert, uh, vertebral level and see if the posterior dura really sags down once the drug reaches there. So it's real, it's a telltale sign that indeed the local anesthetic has reached that particular level. So here you go, you will see this posterior dura getting down. Now, using caudal epidural portal to, in, to insert the catheters as such, it's pretty well known. Now, this is how you will see the catheter going up. Sometimes you will see the catheter going higher up. Sometimes is it you will see it in the anterior epidural space. You will see the fall of the dura due to the injection of the local anesthetic. Coming to the lumbar epidurals again. So lumbar or Epidurals are also very, very commonly used. We use the loss of resistance, especially by saline. The appropriate intervertebral level is palpated and usually 19 or 20 gauge epidural needle is used. So this is how we go. Skin insertion and subcutaneous tissue insertion. Then we remove the stillet. We attach the LOR syringe filled with saline to it. Once the assembly is created, the dominant hand holds the needle and the non-dominant hand pushes the plunger. And very gently, the entire assembly, as it were, is advanced ahead till the give of the ligamentum flavum is felt and is actually elicited, which is unmistakable. The introducer is put in and the required amount of epidural catheter is inserted inside. We can even see this under ultrasound and you will see the flicker here. Now coming to another uh, everyday block is an axillary block. You saw the glimpse of how it can be seen, the probe especially and the needle. This is how it goes. So 
it need not always be a hockey stick probe. It can be any high frequency linear probe and this is how the needle gets in. Now we, we shall go to the ultrasound scan. So here it goes. This is the intraclavicular area, the femoral block. This is the femoral nerve, artery, vein, femoral nerve, the drug around. You can even see the catheter going here. You can give it with peripheral nerve stimulator as well. Very commonly used block again. Sciatic, so this is the sciatic nerve. This is the local anesthetic all around. We can even put the catheters here. This is the catheter coming out as if it, you can see the catheter and the two he needle that is used, the longitudinal section of the sciatic nerve. And you will see the catheter walking along. So these were just the glimpses of what is possible. So these are the most common blocks that at least we use in our practice. Now let's uh, go ahead and uh, see which is the important block. We would still say that it is the caudal epidural, which is the RSVP. Although we know that every day almost a new block emerges, but this has retained its place because it's the most relevant block. It's the most simple block. It's the most valuable block. And it is a portal through which even continuous catheterization is so much possible in very small babies where we really are so, so worried to give analgesics on the floors or even in the PICUs. They're more worried about the side effects and the effects of analgesics, like such as opioids. And hence, the cardinal epidemic really remains still a very, very valuable portal for us. Coming to the, the most recently uh, described blocks in pediatric irrigation anesthesia, well, they are as follows. I'm going to run the video through it for you to see. First will be the QL, that is the quadratus lumborum block. The assembly is as follows. So this is the injection done. This is the QL muscle. This is the, the, the transverse process and the vertebral body, a bunny rabbit as it were. The psoas is here. This is the nerve root coming out and this is the erector spinae and this is the QL. So, and this is the abdominal wall muscles. So you will see the QL2 here, QL1 here. This will be, yeah. Coming to the erector spinae, these are the transverse processes. If you want to see at the level of la minus, then this is how it will, the needle will come in. I, be at the tip of the transverse process or go towards the lamina. This is how it would happen. This is the erector spinae. Paravertebral, again, lying down. This is the typical paravertebral space, the transverse, yes. And this is the block that we really practice very often, the fascia iliac compartment block. This is the iliacus muscle as such, and the needle really walks in straight like this. And we create a lot of space by injecting half the calculated volume, so 10 kilogram child. Uh, so we use around 5 ml going first, open up the fascia iliaca, and then thread in the catheter inside. In grown-up children, we have even inserted or injected dyes in. We've uh, shown that they almost reach till T4, uh, uh, sorry, L4, and haven't seen them really going all throughout. But yes, they have uh, kind of, you know, demarcated the psoas at the lower border. Now coming to dosages, make it very simple. You can use bupivacaine, tropivacaine, levobupivacaine. Anything is, all, all drugs can be used in the volume of 0 0.5 ml per kilogram and the concentration as given here for any peripheral block and lignocanadinaline for any peripheral block. So this is a very, very simple way of remembering it. I'm not going to read out the whole table. It's for, um, for you to refer. Now coming to local anesthetic in caudal epidural, the, here the story is a little different. Now we can... What holds really true is the, cal the volume and how far we reach with the volume. In very small babies, this really holds true. So for uh, lower limb and penile surgeries, 0.5 ml per kilogram. For hernia and opex is 1 to 1.25 ml per kilogram. 1.25 ml, uh, ml per kilogram is a good volume for slightly grown-up kids. And lower thoracic, 1.25 ml per kilogram. Once the lordotic curve really sets in, this may not hold true, is what our clinical experience is. Now, if you want to inf start infusions for continuous blocks, this is your dosage. 
is bupivacaine really unsafe? And it's, is ropivacaine really uh, very, very safe? Actually, it so happens that the Tmax of ropivacaine comes a little later than bupivacaine. So if you are a busy pediatric anesthesia practitioner, probably you've given a caudal epidural or whatever block with bupivacaine, it's going to peak up right in front of you and not when the child is in the recovery. So, however, ropivacaine has a beautiful pharmacokinetics and dynamic profile for infusions. With regional anesthesia in your hand and you being very comfortable, you might uh, go over a little broad in your indications and use them as to treat ischemias. So we have done certain uh, cases which really helped us out by increasing the vascularity. They were almost, these fingertips were almost going blue and they have changed back and we could salvage extremities. So something that would, that the tips would have fallen off is actually holding his spectacles here, this kid. In sick neonates, actually we could just give whiff of civoflurane and drain even their shoulders. So this is how we have applied regionals in many facets. Coming to something that could have been otherwise an contraindication, but if we have ultrasound and we understand how to pick up the normal looking uh, architecture as such, especially of the central neuroaxial conduit, then yes, we could go ahead and put in uh, catheters where we could really not do it before. So this is, this, is, this is what was revealed to us when we did more and more of it. Coming to continuous perineural catheters and compartment syndrome. Now that's something that we really are worried all the time. That if you do put perineural catheters, then you see to it that you 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 give them a sensory block and not the motor one, so that the motor movements remain intact. Don't give them a a dead extremity is what I'm trying to tell you. It, because if you have a radial club hand and this kind of a spine, a very uh, very mild block, in fact, is going to do the trick. So a little bit of NSA and a little and, and a ropivacaine of zero point two percent in the operative perioperative area with good movements, in fact, is going to is going to really nail the management of pain for this crucial uh, invasive cases. We have used thoracic epidural as a diagnostic and therapeutic tool for intractable arrhythmias. If you want to know more about and if time permits, maybe we can discuss more about this, uh, which I would love to share. We have kept catheters. We have told ourselves that, yes, a sympathectomy, hence, is going to help this baby or these children as such. Now, if you really want to put catheters for major surgeries, I know that there are a lot of other modalities that have come up, such as, say, erector spinase, such as QLs, yes, of course, such as tap blocks, yes, of course, they are. But something like, uh, like extrafees, yes, when there is an orthopedic team and a surgical team working, invasive procedure, there is still a big scope for continuous epidural, even in neonates, but then it needs the respect. So this is how we put our epidural catheters very away from any other infusion and we label it well. Sometimes, however, however alluring abdominal wall blocks are, intense abdomens, this is what happens to them. This is what happens to the wall of the abdomen. It's very difficult, even with ultrasound, to really say which is what, which may not be a very good idea. doesn't happen all the time, but just to give you another perspective of modalities. So how will, in nutshell, what would we really look at pediatric anesthesia? Pediatric regional anesthesia as such is, there are certain yums and niyams, as we call in our language. So we certain pledges. So we, I will keep intralipid available. Then I will keep, I will keep in mind to choose the most appropriate block and equipment. I will choose the safest drug dose and modality. I will inject after negative aspiration and in aliquots. I will wait for the block to act or be aware that the block may not have taken up yet. 
I will monitor the block action and infusion in the post-operative period till the catheters are removed in case I have put a catheter. I will make all efforts to synchronize with the surgical team. I will keep records of what I do and audit them. I will be truthful in analyzing block efficacy, take full responsibility for its failures. I will keep abreast with the latest. So yes, thank you for listening. This is the, just a glimpse of what can be done with pediatric regional anesthesia. Thank you indeed. And I hope you have enjoyed the CME. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ishali. It's a very interesting presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear? Yes. Okay, it was a very nice presentation. You have okay. done a great job. And uh, because as you have presented, it is very fast. We know the depth of the work that you have involved in it. I'm can so you glad. please mention? Uh, <laughs> it is a very nice presentation. Can you please mention some of the methods by which you are monitoring the block and not? Some of the methods. Especially in um, infants and children. I understand the question. How you were monitoring the blocks? Yes, you've asked me one of the most wonderful questions I've ever answered. So how do you, how do you really look after the pain and how do you know whether to step up the infusion or decrease or whether to add something else? So let us come to maybe infants is what you wanted to ask me. Well, infants is in fact a bit easier to handle than neonates as such, because if infants have come for an orthopedic surgery, it's very easy to keep them happy if they are with their mothers. So once they are with their mothers, they are fed well, mother's lap infusion going on, they're happy. If they, are, if, if they start crying, either a feed or a toy, or roam around with them a bit. If the infusion is not a syringe pump, then fine, uh, it's, it's a controllable pain. No matter what you do and they still cry, the mother's lap or any distraction doesn't help them, then do something about it. Don't step up the infusion right away. If it's an orthopedic surgery, ask the surgeon to come and look at the plaster fullness because maybe that's some compartment syndrome coming up. Because say for four to six hours post-surgery, your infusion of a minimal ropivacaine is going on well, everything was fine. And now the infant or the next day, the infant starts becoming very irritable. Don't step up analgesics. First, let the surgical colleague look at it. And of course, go and examine whether your infusion is going on well. Go and examine whether, you know, there is a damp diaper. Or go, go and examine some rash or something here or there, but don't step up there unless you have, unless you know the reason, don't step up anything. If they have come and seen that there is no plaster fullness, go ahead, give a bolus or maybe go to an NSA. But if it's an infant, then maybe we will go to a paracetamol suppository. Yeah, are That's you... Uh, Ah, yes. Are you combining general anesthesia with this or very DP much. set? Yes. In in infants and uh, in children, yes, very much. We do combine yes. general okay. anesthesia, but then it's so much of sparing effect that we take an advantage of because the entire operability is given by the regional block, as it were, and we just give a give a very very minimal GA. Okay. Okay, Nalini. Yeah, uh, Rishali, um, it was absolutely superb. And I wish you had gone on and on for the next one hour. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice. Uh, I am Rishali. coming to Kerala CMEs more often. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because, I, because I really get beautifully complimented. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> Okay. You deserve it. You deserve it. And I'm, I'm sure so everybody listening is uh, awestruck and they would have loved to hear you for a little longer time. Uh, Rishali, there's, uh, there's a question that I need to ask you. Now, the children yes. are sleeping when uh, you give them the block, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so how do you measure the effectivity of your block? How do you know that the caudal block has acted? And now, suppose you don't have an ultrasound and you have given a blind block, how are you going to know that your caudal has acted? Once again, a smashing question. Only the person at the head end, that is us, will know whether the, G, whether the regional has taken effect or no. Unlike an adult, where uh, the, the surgeon just picks up his hand and he, 
and he knows whether the block is on or no. It's a fracture extremity and he's going to shout out loud. In children, it just doesn't happen that way. But we standing at the head end know it. Suppose if it's a hernia case, a very, very simple case, say 10, 10 kilogram child lying in front of you, you have given a whiff of silver fluorine, you've given a caudal and you expect that the caudal is going to give you the operability. The surgeon takes a nick. Here we go. There is an increase in heart rate. Suppose if the heart rate is 110, it has to go to 130 or 135. There is an increase in respiratory rate if we have kept the baby on spontaneous respiration. So the, the, the telltale sign is, if not a motor movement, at least an increase in heart rate. And that, mind you, shall happen. Even if you have given opioid in a dose of two microgram per kilogram, or even ketamine for that matter, there's something that regional gives that these two can't. The pulse is rock steady. The breathing shall not change. However, before declaring a failure to yourself, please have a look at the soakage time of the block. Caudal, even in a neonate, is going to take at least three to four minutes to give an entire operability. In an infant, maybe seven to eight minutes. In a grown-up kid for a hypospedias, it's going to take good old 10 minutes. This time is going to be given to you by the orthopods, but not by the pediatric surgeons. So mind you, if the soakage time is correct, and if still this scenario happens, which I just described, declare a block failure to yourself. Uh, is the there yes yes excellent uh, would you um, i mean some i remember reading somewhere that probably you could check the laxity of the anal sphincter and oh, yeah. uh, that kind of a thing uh, which yeah, will that. which will tell you whether the block has worked or not uh, i mean i don't know i vaguely remember reading it somewhere sometime long back so uh, yes. you've said probably. it so rightly you've said it so rightly in fact Typically, at that time, if you put in the suppository, it comes back. <laughs> <laughs> it does happen. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, similarly, uh, Rashali, now, uh, test dose is not something which is practical over here because, again, um, uh, it's not practical when you're giving a block, right? So now, now so how are you going to detect an uh, accidental intravascular injection? Now, Lini, what we can do is we can convert it into practicality, and I shall tell you how. Suppose if you're giving a caudal, because that's, that's where you will need the testos even more. All right. So suppose if you're giving a caudal block, because you are very, very unlikely to use an ultrasound to give a good old simple landmark guided caudal, which acts any which ways if you're good at it. Okay. So, um, and it doesn't take much to be good at caudals. So, if you take the, all that you need for a test dose is five microgram per kilogram of epinephrine, a good old 2% lignocaine adrenaline taken in a dose of five milligram per kilogram is going to give you more than enough of it. Okay. So what we do is we take, say, bupivacaine in a dose of two milligram per kilogram, and we do use lignocaine adrenaline in a dose of, say, four to five milligram per kilogram which gives enough of adrenaline in it to give a test dose. And we milk the advantage of it in two ways. First, it does give an increase in heart rate. If it goes intravascular, it's not that it doesn't. I know that it's not foolproof, but it does give. Second, the onset of action is also hastened. So you can incorporate in your daily use, is what I would say, with the like nook and adrenaline. It's a good test dose. And nothing is lost by giving it. Oh, uh, one question in the chat box is, what sedation uh, you prefer before blocks? Dexmedetomidine or Rikitamin? Rishali? Nice. Yes, nice to what hear. What sedation? From, yes, yes. Nice to hear you from Dr. Uh, from Dr. Naresh. Uh, Dex -ket, yes, it's a good sedation. Well, let me walk you through it. If it is a ba if if it is a kid who's who's learned to think and who's worried about anxiety getting separated from the parents, we would start if possible from pre medication itself. Then after the pre medication, if we don't have an IV, a whiff of sevoflurin, take the IV, use sevoflurin itself and perform the block. Dexcat is a good combination if you already have an IV. Or if the procedure is a, is a long one, four to five hours, Dexcat is wonderful because they complement each other. 
Intranasal, yes, intranasal also can be used or oral pre-medication can also be used. It can be used intranasally too, whatever you say, Dexcate, yes. But uh, for me, the choice would be Medazolam still. Because Ket Dex takes a long time to give me the, 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 the separation, which I, which I probably might need a little faster. I may not have 30 minutes to wait. Right, Rishali. Uh, that was um, handled very in, in a very expert manner. Um, okay. Now, when you are, you do give a lot of infusions of LA, right? Yes, yes, I so, do. Now, in children, you are going to have prolonged elimination half-life and, you yes. know, chances of toxicity and there's a low uh, threshold for seizure. Uh, yes. But and at the same time, uh, you are not going to want to give, uh, you know, uh, one more thing that happens is you might give a little more and then the motor blockade takes place and the child can't feel his legs and he starts getting very distressed. So how do you uh, handle the whole scenario? Nalini, first of all, we shall go for proper prolonged 48 hours or 48 hours plus infusions in very invasive surgeries, such as say maybe hip, hips, congenital hip repair or, or you know, tibia, hemimalia or some orthopedic procedure or a laparotomy or a thoracotomy. This is where we will put catheters. We'll handle, since you have spoken about limbs, we'll handle that. If we have given a dose of propivacaine, which is say a 0 0.2, 0 0.4 milligram per kilogram per hour in a five-year-old five child, this is rarely going to give you a motor block. Rarely. Ropivacaine will rarely give you a motor block. However, if you have started with bupivacaine to begin with, then do not activate a continuous infusion at least till two and a half to three hours. So let the levels of bupivacaine uh, come down and let the motor blockade which bupivacaine causes and lignocaine adrenaline along with if it, if at all it was given, let the motor blockade definitely come down and then reactivate the infusion. But once if we are married to the catheters for 48 hours, if we have put in the catheter, so we need to have a team. I guess Rashmi was trying to say that we need to have a team to look into catheters. Otherwise, I don't think we should put them. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, I, yeah. Okay. Shall we go to Dr. Uh, Rashmi now? Yes. Uh, okay. If you have any more questions, you can. Uh, no, because the topic uh, is, is so very interesting. We can just go on and on. Yeah, and, yeah. Okay, okay, you continue. Okay. Nalini, okay. Nalini is fond of pizza. Nalini. <laughs> I can see that. Okay. Yes. Uh, one last question for you, Rishali. Yes. Um, uh, now, you are not going to have the paresthesia to be elicited here in children. So, what, what happens with the spinal cord uh, injury? I mean, just in case you land up with something like that, how are you going to handle it? And how will you know you've landed up with this problem? Wow. Okay. How do I how do I know that the spinal cord has gotten injured? Uh, touch wood. I'm just thinking aloud now. I know. I have, I know. It's because never I, happened with you, but then yes, it can happen to yes, the It can happen. Yes. So uh, uh, first is uh, uh, first is don't give your epidurals or spinals in very small kids to your to, to your trainer, trainees right from the day one. Let them graduate, as it were, from bigger kids to smaller kids. Somehow, somehow, RA in pediatrics, I don't know where the guardian angel is, but they are very, very forgiving. And pick up the block which is the safest. Maybe I'm just trying to put out the reasons to you why I might not, might not have seen it till now. So pick up the lowest level, come to the caudal portals first, then go to the extreme lower lumbar portals first. Be very gentle in picking up the, the sites and the equipments that you're using. Uh, and touch wood, I haven't seen a spinal cord trauma as such, but if at all it ever happens, I guess the, the, I, I guess the treatment would be just the same as any other, other case in in, in adults, I guess. I mean, there is a quadriplegia reported when general anesthesia plus a thoracic epidural was given, but that too was in adults. 
maybe these tissues are pretty forgiving in children and maybe we are far more cautious in children yes most probably because we are giving only the correct dose of the drug that is required that may be the reason that we are not seeing much of the complication yes. especially and we are never because reckless we, yes we are, we are never reckless and yes, we, we we generally try, try to we we just simply become very gentle when it comes to them yes uh, with children you are very right with children we are very very careful with the mm-hmm. adults it's a little casualness does come in especially when you have done say 100 in the 101st one uh, you are a little casual you are very right about that while children even if it is the 100th and first one or even 1000th and first one you are very very careful you are very right on that but but i, I but i'm sure there's a guardian angel here i'm mm. sure I believe so. I believe so because not everybody is Rishali, and there are so many pain management portals opening up now, and a lot of people are beginning to practice. So uh, that's that's a that's an area to be concerned about because we yes. really do not know uh, how cautious they're going to be. Yes. So that that that's why I asked this question now, uh, Rishali. We all prefer to give regional anesthesia as far as possible, even in children as well as in neonates also. We yes. prefer to give because we have we can reduce the dosage of the all the sedative drugs as well as the inhalation agents that we can uh, we can reduce the dosages. That's why we prefer to give as well as the regional blocks as well as uh, the suppositories also the pain relief yes. for pain relief. Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you, Rishali. Uh, I have one uh, question for me to Dr. Nishmi is that what are the consequences of this unrelieved acute postoperative pain? Yeah, consequences. Had, yeah, the consequences. Uh, not to mention a very distressed patient and yes. uh, unsatisfied patient uh, and a very unsatisfied surgeon. Uh, apart from that, uh, these other the thing which uh, carry on, they linger on more than two months. If the pain, uh, you know, the lingering pain carries on, which could be because of a cut nerve with a neuroma forming over there, whatever may be the reason, uh, it. Uh, it is. Uh, it becomes one of those chronic pain syndromes then, yes, and okay. uh, then it is very difficult. Uh, you know, as uh, I think all of us who have dealt with the pain clinics, uh, we realize that uh, you know managing a chronic pain is um, uh, again very hit and dry, and uh, you have to have a lot of uh, um, uh, polypharmacy, like I said, for that. So, uh, okay. now, persistent p- post-op pain. That is why it is very essential to cure that first. And now and also, you, you have the global uh, uh, kind of a scenario which is campaigning for uh, pain being the fifth vital sign. Vital so, sign. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'd like to mention one thing. Uh, with the, uh, when uh, Sevoflurin was introduced, especially from one particular company when it had come from and uh, the, uh, the same, the child post Sevoflurin used to cry a lot and uh, on emergence. And uh, it was, uh, you know, always the thing, whether is it because of pain or is it because of the emergence? And uh, like uh, Rushali has just mentioned, it is very difficult to know why is the child crying? Is it just the fear at that time? Is it because of uh, pain or is it because of actual the emergence which took place? Uh, it is difficult to, to the thing. And that time in all the three cases, pulse rate increases. The respiratory rate obviously is high because the uh, child is uh, crying away to glory. Uh, Rushali, I would love to know how did you differentiate between all that? If it, it is a yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, with C, with Sevoflurane coming in and a goodbye to halothane, I really miss the recovery of halothane, which used to be mm. very very soothing. In fact, well, with Sevoflurane emergence, there is one thing you really don't need to think if it's an emergence. An emergence is an emergence in a school going kid. It in in an infant they. Uh, you you know your block has acted. You know his he can't even move his lower extremity because you've given a strong caudal. But he's crying to glory. He wouldn't open his eyes. He wouldn't respond to his mom. He, he just doesn't belong to this world. He just is crying, throwing around whatever body parts can be moved. It is even if they, even uh, of course not the blocked one. And if the if if you've not given a motor block, he would move everything. Nothing under the world seems to pacify him. Other than probably propofol, that's yeah. emergence delivery. That was the only thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Even if we have fed even glucose water, a couple of drops here and there. Uh, if it's not an emergence delirium, they just start sucking on it as if they were thirsty and they just want to now quench a lot. 
or they'll start sucking on a pacifier. Nothing of that helps. They don't even look at their mother. They they want to throw the world away. That's emergence delirium. Yeah, I know. Okay, um, any more questions, Dr. Nandi ma'am? Yeah, Anita, yes. now uh, one, one more question regarding patients who are not able to self-report pain. I mean, I'm talking about the adult patients. How are you going to handle them? And how do you realize that, yes, in what grade of pain are they in right now? How do you assess and how would you manage them? I'm talking about mm -hmm. the patients who are probably, you know, the geriatric patients okay. or the mm -hmm. ones with cognitive uh, deficiencies. How are they, even in children? I mean, uh, Rishali uh, will definitely tell you that you have it in children also. But in children, at least you you know they're crying, they're bawling, and you got to give them something. But adults who are not able to self-report, how are you going to find out? And how do you manage? And how do you know if you're given adequate pain relief? Um, wow. is, that question directed towards me? Yes, yeah. Anita. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, fine. Um, uh, okay. Now, yes, you're right. There, There's a, uh, a group of people which come in, especially the elderly, who are very, uh, you know, agitated, a little bit of Alzheimer's, and uh, they come in senile dementia, they come in over there, and they're very agitated. At that particular time, you're very right. We do, uh, and their uh, the classical signs, which are their pulse and uh, respiratory rate, are increased. Uh, so we give what is the... What I have been doing, this is my personal practice, that I give what is the appropriate dose of that particular medicine to, uh, for his weight. Just give that and his age. Just give that and uh, little boluses on top. Just small, small boluses. We don't give too much. Like if I'm giving fentanyl, which uh, suppose I do that, just small little five, milli, uh, five microgram, five, uh, see, very small subsequently because when it will hit them, you do not know. And I prefer a shorter uh, acting. And that is the time when I would love to have, say, something like Remy fentanyl, but uh, that's a constant infusion. But I use fentanyl in those cases, very short, small doses or paracetamol. Go over to paracetamol, give them a, a complete uh, coverage. In fact, uh, with all these, um, you know, especially with the COVID times and uh, all, and in elderly, it is better to go in over for uh, acetaminophen, which I find uh, IV is quite uh, good. A little bit of, uh, uh, I would not like to give any sedation at that particular time. So it's just small boats keep going in. You know, Nalini and Samshad, I can tell you one yeah. thing, your questions are out of the world here. Yes. <laughs> 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 he, he, he's just talking about a child who cannot report. I agree. Now, we, you will have a whole lot of pediatric ortho spectrum, which is cerebral palsy. And they, yes. they, may, they may not have a proper mental capacity even to say what's happening. Uh, yes. I'm talking about the real, real MRs. And there are, of course, intelligent CPs as well who will tell you exactly. But still, there is one link between them. They're primary caretakers. They will tell you whether it is hunger, whether it is pain, whether it is yes. anything else, whether it's the plaster that is irritating them or whether it's the spasm that has set in. So you will, you, you will have to depend a lot on their families to read pain for you. Your pain scores will not work at that time. You're, uh, you're right in this way, but uh, when we have adult MRs and uh, we have senile, uh, you know, that elderly Dementic patients, the dementia pa patients yes. that is the time when it becomes very difficult because even the uh, caretakers, primary caretakers are also not able to tell you what exactly is wrong. So uh, that is a point. Excellent. Okay, Excellent. These the, handled. Excellent. Okay, Excellent. these are the two important points. That is the extremes of age. It will be very difficult for us to assist. And we have to depend upon the caretakers as well as we have to be very careful when we deal with the pain. Especially the such a common uh, response that uh, after the immediate positivity period, we have to assist the patient properly. And that is the most uh, sensitive part of it. That is the pain relief. Okay. And you can't leave them unattended. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. And now you have the policy of dreaming. That is, I think it stands for drinking, eating, and mobilizing, mobilizing. within the first uh, post-operative day, uh, okay. especially if you want to discharge them and after ambulatory surgery and things like that. Yes. So, and okay. yes. 
So you yes, have yes. to, that's one of the quality assurance, uh, you know, that you get the seal for having given a good pain relief, good uh, anesthetic, uh, post-operative so anesthetic care, yes. The responsibility of the anesthesiologist is increasing in such conditions. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. So, um, okay. I do Shall not know. Vinil? <laughs> okay, ma'am. No, Dr. Nalini, you continue. Madam, okay. madam if, uh, you are, if you are accepting, you can take questions from the uh, participants. Because today we have many senior colleagues from all over India, including so many HODs. And he, even now they are listening to us. So you can take the opinion from them and you can uh, you can take the questions from them directly. They, you can ask them to unmute and ask directly. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. Very senior, very, very senior are there today. All are very seniors who have attended from the beginning to end. Unfortunate juniors have not attended when the class are like this. But very, very seniors, HODs and others have attended from all over India. Malsun is there, Sitora is there. HOD is from all over India. Dr. Anita Malik is there. Then Vishwanath Hiremat, many, many. Bhimeshwar is there. All HODs uh, today. It's all very senior. They have recognized the importance of seniors. S. Ramesh was there. And the juniors, they don't understand uh, whom to hear and whom not to hear. <laughs> yeah, it is for uh, Binil. You can unmute all and if anybody yeah, wants they to. Can, they can unmute and ask directly, sir. Yeah. I have changed the settings already. Okay, till somebody asks, Rashmi, uh, I have one more uh, point. I I loved your, uh, what is that, ALS or APS? What was it? APS. 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 services. Yeah. Ah, APS the, services. The yeah. errand boy who runs with that little bag of his. Oh, that's... Oh, uh, yes. That's, with the wonderful uh, little uh, designs on it, we try to make it, you know, um, uh, absolutely unique so that everybody knows here comes the APS man uh, or woman, as the case may be. And uh, uh, he went around, all around. With the, all the medicines there, it's a small bag and he was available on the, uh, you know, one, uh, uh, you know, particular mobile number which we gave uh, for him and we put this number all around so the surgeons knew initially it was like what can you do what we can't do type but when they realized that the top ups and everything we were coming and taking care of even for the uh, IV medications the parental ones also they said okay fine so now the the uh, uh, post-op instructions used to be pain relief as per anesthesiologist finished so uh, we, we had taken over we had uh, taken over completely Wonderful. That would have taken care of uh, MPS. Just, a bit, just my few, my two cents here. I, I somehow feel, of course, we have to be there and our, our contribution has to be there. Uh, but I think the most important person in the APS is the ward staff. Oh, yes. It, it, I mean, she. If, if they can be trained with regular lecturing, if you can make them understand elastomeric pumps, if you can make them understand why epidural and why the epidural leaks and what can be the top-ups and how to read pain. Because you just said, Nalini, that pain is the third vital sign. If they can be trained, they can even give a SOS. If, if the order is SOS bolus, when the pain score is, say, 5 on 10, maybe for a, for a child of 11 years who can actually number the pain, they will manage it and they will put it on the group that such and such a patient has been given a bolus or will ask you if I can give a bolus or will ask you where the paracetamol can be given. So if you can make an autopilot kind of an APS where you are of course there and involve an intensivist as well because as she said, fentanyl is something that she won't just give. Maybe that kind of a person can walk up because sometimes your regional may, may just not work or may come out. A child might just pull out the epidural catheter or, or an intraclavicular catheter. So at that time, maybe you might need tramadol. Maybe you might need something more than anything. So maybe it's a good idea to have an intensivist involved. So yeah, uh, Rupali, I is going to go well. Yeah, I'll just tell you one thing. In the armed forces, our nursing officers, nursing staff are very well trained. Number one, they're educated. They're like their level is pretty the same, and most of them are quite familiar with these medicines. It did not take us too long to tell them the to look at the red flag signs. You know, these are the flag signs which they should be. Aware of. And they were informers. 
uh, nursing staff, you're very right. Uh, if my ICU uh, uh, nurse tells me that, uh, just have a look at this particular patient. I will, like, I will definitely go and examine the patient from top to bottom because she's monitoring that uh, patient. Uh, oddly, I'm seeing uh, the patient not so frequently as compared to her. Uh, but we have this advantage that uh, the uh, girls are very well trained. So some of them are, uh, you know, uh, postgraduates also. So it's okay. Uh, but we still have taken their classes before that. Binal, I was expecting uh, um, the audience, a lot of seniors here. Unless... Uh, because the because we can just go on and on. It's so interesting, and we've got such fantastic speakers. All three of the, of them have been absolutely superb and excellent. They have been wonderful, yeah, and and it was a very good. It's a very good session. All the three talks were very uh, elaborate, and they have given very good explanations for all the questions that we have asked. And it was very nice, and it is a memorable also. That is. Also, in this International Women's Day, all the women were performed very well. So you should congratulate you. Dr. Venkat Giri. <laughs> <laughs> you should okay. congratulate Dr. Venkat Giri, this brainchild. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. It, it and, and Yes, and I loved his concept of running from one person to the other before they get hijacked by somebody. <laughs> that was such a... <laughs> <laughs> that is such a cute statement oh, that he made. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, if uh, I think uh, we could call it a day after this, uh, because it's been wonderful, it's been excellent, and I would love to interact some more. But then uh, it's not fair. It's not fair. <laughs> Rishali is looking uh, kind of, uh, oh my God, <laughs> when are we going to close? <laughs> yeah, <not really. laughs>